Okay, we got a little bit of time today. I want to work on the nose of this plane. I want to get the tank, and I want to get the tank venting in. And that's one of the most commonly asked, I guess, you know, you get to the Nats or wherever, and people look and they see your tank vents, and they say, how do you vent your tank? Well, and why do you do it that way? So let me do a little two-minute storyboard on this. It'll be a big help, and then we'll actually get to do it, because uh, hopefully Robert Sabatino will be here later with his nobler, and we're going to try to finish that today. That's today's big project. Now let's go back. I, I guess we all remember this, the old days of the nobler. And needless to say, unlike everybody else I built, uh, the way the nobler tank went in is when you built the plane, there was no plywood doublers and you had to make this special size tank. And it was really a very inconvenient thing that you couldn't use a two, a two inch wide tank. And generally what people would do is they would solder the vent into the tank and then run it out the bottom of the plane as, as if you did it the way the plan show. And you'd have the uniflow pipe soldered from the tank while it was still in position coming up like so. And if you look at the plans of an old nobler, that was standard technology. But what was different was the tank was glued in position. Now what would usually happen if you had a leaky tank at some point in time, and, and this tank was leaking, that was the end of the airplane. It, it pretty much put the kibosh on that plane. So what happened is years later, and I guess this, you know, it just evolved that way, people figured out you needed to have a removable tank. So later on, any noblers or any later designs, and uh, none in particular, they made the tank that you could just slide it out. And one of the things that became a vogue thing in the 80s and maybe even before is they would solder the vents to the, actually to the tank. And this would be on the outside of the plane. Jimmy Casale used to do this, Lou Dudka. And the only problem with this was it was always prone to this solder because this became a tuning fork when the engine was running. And it would always tend to leak. And it, believe me, it happened to Lou and Glenn at one of the team trials. So that became, oh, gee, I don't know how cool that is. And then what would happen too is the downside of doing it that way was if you do a nose section is you would, and the tank was back here, you needed this tremendous notch in the fuselage to let the vents out. Well, all that aside, all that I guess somehow you could live with or you could justify, but it still was a very risky, old-fashioned system, old-fashioned way of doing things. I think it's safe to say pretty much now that everybody were pr pretty near everybody that builds competitive airplanes has removable gas tanks. Removable gas tanks are just standard equipment. And they always have a way of, of sliding out the front of the plane somehow. I don't know anybody that builds the, plane, the, the tank into the plane anymore. And the reason you need a V-deflector or you need some structure in the case of a, of a pattern master type of nose, you need wood between the mounts, or you need some structure down here, a V-deflector or something, is to, is to make a box, a solid box, and this is so important to understand. If you make, and let's, let's pretend we're looking from the front, if you make a nose section, and you do this, and okay, you can slide the tank and shim the tank. By the way, old-fashioned tanks, you never could shim the tank either. That was another downside. Let me get the phone. Okay, we're back, and what I wanted to to just make a point of, and this is something old Drindak made a real good point of, is when you make this kind of fuselage, basically you're making a tank box. 
And the part that a lot of people, even years ago, even myself, didn't realize is you have to complete the box. Underneath here, you have to either put a V deflector, some kind of a former, something that connects the box so that this whole thing is a box and it's it's certainly not this. See, this is no good. This is what when people have vibration problems and they just have a little block or something here and they leave out that former. Because years ago all planes had a plywood former here. That was and you couldn't get the tank out. Well now you eliminate this former and what takes its place is the wood between the mounts. So if you know that you have a real good head start on getting something like a reliable motor run. Thing I always insist on doing and I'll just I'll bet you at least once a week I get somebody that calls up and says, ah, I bought a Fox 35 or a Newt Gingrich 28 or something, and should I run it on muffler pressure or should I run it on you? Well, the answer is always, no matter if you, even if you have a tune pipe, if you have no tune pipe, if you have a 60, if you have a 35, if you have a K and B40, always set up the plane for all the options. To set up the plane for all the options, what you need to have, kind of simple, it really isn't that complicated. The tank is removable. So that's option one. Removable tank. That means if the tank leaks, you can go in, pull it out, put another tank in. So you try to set right from the get-go is set up all the options. And it's so it's it's like you would think common sense, but a lot of times you don't think of it that way. You'd like to have the vent that the uniflow vent in the plane. And we're going to do this real in real time here. And an overflow, two tubes glued to the airplane, two plywood with some kind of very secure system. And then connect, somehow connect those with rubber tubing. Now that vibration isolates things. If you start looking at the options, these are all the options. These are the things that I would like to have in every plane. Now, I'd also like to have, we just ran into this last week test in the double star. Here we go out to the field. We have the double star all set up. And we want to try running it on muffler pressure just to see. We want to have all the options. No muffler pressure fitting. Well, even if you have a tongue muffler, a barrel muffler, and you have a pressure fitting, what it allows you to do is run muffler pressure or no muffler pressure. It gives the muffler pressure will be able to stabilize the run. The uniflow will make the brake a lot harsher. So you want to have a pressure fitting. Whether you have a tune pipe, even if you have a tune pipe or no tune pipe or 60 or barrel muffler, no matter what you, a pressure fitting. That's one of our next projects to work on to get Tsunami for another test day. Want to get a tongue muffler with a pressure fitting. So once you have this many options, and the last option would be that you would be able to move the tank, and I'm just going to make a question mark here. I always try to leave room for a six ounce tank and then use a five ounce tank. And that gives me one more option. By putting the tank closer to the engine, I can soften the motor brake by moving the tank further back, and a good example of this is go look at John DeTavio's plans to the Falcon. The tank is uh, two feet away from the motor. A harsh brake. Now, if a plane is heavy, I like to have the tank as far back as possible. If a plane is relatively light, the tank as far forward as possible. Now, what this does, this in combination with running different props, different venturis, filter and no filter, and I'll just put the last thing here. I want to have a filter in the system for at least the first three or four days of flying, and when I'm all done, I want to run it no filter, and then a filter with one screen. I take out the, the screen with the very fine mesh. Can't even spell screen. This is terrible. But anyway, you will you will notice a change in the motor on a very subtle change. But by having these options, what you have is a is a tremendous ability to vary the power characteristics of the motor without ever touching the motor. Just moving the tank back and forward. Another thing that I've learned over the years is if you look down the plane, this is really, and you, uh, this does not even include the tank shims, and we'll get into tank shims when we trim the plane out. If you look down at this, 
in an all-perfect world, I would like to have the tank running right down the middle of the plane. Now, I know some people like to, Brian Ether, for instance, likes to cock this side of the tank out. This is exaggerated, of course, so that it picks up the last little drop of fuel. But if you're looking to have a clean shutoff, you might even want to cock the tank the other way. When you cock the tank this way, you don't get a clean shutoff. You get those last two or three laps, burp, 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 before it shuts off. Okay, the tank itself is always a standard tank. Woody Midgley made me tanks. Big Jim made me tanks. They're all very similar. They're all very good. What I like to do is set them up in such a way that the overflow vent can go out the plane. Of course, this is upside down. This, this vent <laughs> is going to go out the plane and then down, but the overflow. and the So I can get the motor. I have the choice of getting this tank shoved right up if we look from the top, the tank can wind up right on the back of the motor with the vents on the side. If you have a vent in the middle of the tank, you can't get that last half inch of, of being able to move the tank back and forth. So this, you lose one of your options when you do that. So if you're going to have a custom made tank or a custom vented tank, no matter who's going to make it, that's one of the choices you'd like to have is the vents spread out. Also, before you go and do anything, before the tank actually goes in the plane is clean it. Obviously when you're done doing your soldering or venting or reventing or whatever, pressure test it. Now we just had this problem with Tsunami. We had it put away with automatic transmission fluid in the tank and it was clogging up filters and black stuff was coming out of it and it took a whole day of flying before it stopped coming out. Let me get the phone. I'll just put this here. Whenever you put the tank away, store it with fuel in it. That'll give you, a, a, let's hope, a good start on having some reliability, but most of all, adjustability. And when you get to the field, no matter what the conditions are, you can run uniflow, no uniflow, muffler pressure, no muffler pressure. And at some near future time, we're going to try to make up a chart of, we're going to try to do some new videos on props and new videos on motor tuning, and I'm going to try to really document all of the options on setting up a fuel tank with little flow charts and stuff. That's coming, but for right now, I want to go work on that sea fire. I want to try to get the tank vents in. Now, one of the first things I try to do here, I want to get work on this nose area. I want to take a number 26 blade in the side that's not sharp and scrape all the paint off the pad so the motor sits nice and straight. I want to mark where I want my venting to go and I want to get a pin sharpened up like very very sharp and wherever I want that hopefully that vent to go I want to be able to see a little pinhole. Now see I tried to engineer this up that it wouldn't come out and hit the exhaust manifolds but again I still have to know that. I also need to look for a nice solid part of this where I know I can get a good grip. I don't want to put it through a, through a balsa side. I want to put it through it as a plywood double there too. You can see the back end of the blade just scratch it. I don't want to scratch the paint off the wood. I just want to get it off the aluminum so the motor, when I get to install the motor here, it'll fit nice and tight. And usually it'll come right off. Dope doesn't really have a real ability to stick to any kind of metal. <laughs> or fillets, that's for sure. I like to use some of that 400 steel wool just to clean these up. I want the motor to sit perfectly flat and make sure all my fits are nice and tight. I don't want a big lump of paint under the motor and then squeeze it and all the alignments to be as accurate as I can get them. <laughs> I locate where I want the vent to be from the inside with the pin. I want it to be as close to the mount as possible. If you make this come up off the mount, it's difficult to get the tank in and out. So that shows me that I calculated, well, almost good enough here. And that'll be my pin, my little pivot point to drill an eighth inch hole. Now, rather than using a drill, a lot of times it's easier to use a bit. It doesn't grind and get right in there. Go up and grab, just exactly what I said. It doesn't grab and I'll and take a big chunk out of the other side. Okay, that looks pretty decent. Have that little 
bit in there, I try to scrape away some of the paint, roughen it up so that the epoxy gets a real good grip. Roughen that up, I got the two holes drilled. Picking up the tank vents with ordinary eighth inch brass tubing. Now, just one thought, I have tried to use aluminum. Nah, not worth saving the weight, and aluminum gets tarred with age and cracks and everything. Brass is definitely, or copper, whatever you want, is definitely the material of choice. Plus, you can solder it as a side benefit. Every Higley bender, obviously we need a little drill. I gotta find a drill. I use a drill, they give you a pin, but just having this is one of the things that uh, you want to make a first vent and then if you decide you need to make it longer, shorter, wider, bigger, but you need one to get a square one. And one of the tricks is you don't want to bend it more than 90 degrees and then bend it back, hopefully. I say we bent that too far. I don't like, see when you go more than 90 you put a kink of what happens when you bend it back. Let me just show you. It almost always splits. Oh, there you go. Now if you put that tank vent into the plane and you had that either a little air bubble there or whatever, a little air leak, you'd never get a good uniflow run, number one. Number two, you'd have fuel going down. So, hey, almost like I did that on purpose. Let's go out and bend one now. If the tubing isn't bending as nice as you'd like it to bend, in fact, this might not be a piece of annealed tubing. Some of this tubing needs to be annealed. When I say annealed, you need to heat it with a torch and then let it just cool normally. You just want to heat the tubing cherry red. You can buy this tubing either annealed or not annealed. It, it'll come either way, and it comes obviously in brass and copper. Brass tubing you don't have to do this with. I only think I don't have any brass here. But if you anneal the copper, it'll be just as good. By the way, this is something you should do to all tank vents too. It keeps them from splitting. You want to get it, and we're just coming up on cherry red right here. There's cherry red. There it is. Let the whole thing go to cherry red except right where your hand is holding it, which you won't have to worry about doing that. You'll get a little warning. <laughs> now what'll be, the tubing will be a lot softer when you do this. Once the tubing kind of cools on its own, I like to clean it first. There's always some oxidation on the outside of it. 1,200 sandpaper or steel will get it clean. And you'll notice that, well, it's still a little warm. The tubing is a lot softer and more pliable now. Now, one of the hardest things to convince anybody of is how important it is to have a smooth edge. Razor edges on the end of tubing that are inside the plane make little pinholes in the neoprene and the flex tubing, and it makes you crazy. By the way, these Bud McKnight <coughs> sanding sticks, these are great. Bob Sabatino brought some over, Bob Martin sent some. These things are just invaluable for doing this kind of work. Nice smooth edge, number one. Boy, you don't want to have a razor edge. Or run your hand on it. See if you can cut your hand with it. If you can't cut your hand with it, you probably won't be able to cut the tubing either. Now what I try to do, I set up the vent, I trim the length inside the plane. One is the overflow, of course the long one is the fill. I push the, the eyelet. By the way, if you need some of these eyelets that fit conveniently right over them, you don't want to use the SIG ones. You can use the SIG ones, of course. SIG 8th inch eyelets. But I get, I'll be glad to send you a bunch of them. I have about 10,000 of them from making bell cranks. And it's a $175 minimum order from Stimson. So keep in mind two things that I've run into problems with. If you polish this, highly polish it, what happens in time, or it can happen, is the tubing can fall off from the muffler pressure. Or when you're fueling a plane, you the tube jumps off and the fuel goes all over the plane. Number two, the, the tubing inside the plane, when I get done soldering these eyelets in position, I'm going to put some knurls on this so that the tubing gets a good grip. Now keep in mind, inside the plane, some kind of a little knurl system, and I want to use some Stay Bright solder and solder these eyelets in position next. A 
couple of things. I just soldered these. Notice I see, just, just like doing plumbing solder, you see the solder come out the end. And I know I have a good solid joint. Now I'll let this get this cleaned up with some 1200 sandpaper. I put some defluxing agent on it, baking soda and water. I'm just waiting for it to go to totally cool. You don't want to just dip this in water. Just let it cool normally. You can even, can even touch it a little bit by now. Now the deal is, this gives you a little bit of extra diameter. So I want to knurl that. I want to take that parting wheel and just put some little scuffs in that because that gives the epoxy a good grip that this can't rotate in time. And boy, if you've ever had to replace a tank vent, by the way, if you do, the way to get the old one out is hold a solder and iron on it. It'll warm the epoxy, pull it right out, and put a new one in. But it's a lot better. By then, everything is oil soaked. It's a lot better if you can get this a proper bond now. We're going to knurl this up so that when this slides into the fuselage, it'll be a press fit almost, and that epoxy will have a real good grip right on that oversized diameter. Right where that diameter gets a little bit bigger, that's where I want the grip. See the parting wheel just gives that epoxy a lot of grip there. Now I want to also take, just take some like 220 paper and put some knurls in here so that the tubing inside the plane doesn't slide off. It just roughens up the surface just enough that the tubing won't slide off, hopefully. Okay, we're ready to mix up some slow drying epoxy. Now it'll be ready to install. Nice if you have it is to, to mic this eyelet diameter up and just run a drill that's exactly that diameter in there, which we've already done. Gives us a nice tight fit and just to minimize the amount of epoxy, get a nice tight press fit. Remember, we're not looking for a big glob of epoxy. What we're looking for is a really nice tight solid joint. I got a nice tight press fit in there. I put a little bit of black dye in the epoxy. We could try to get as tight of a joint here as we can. I'm going to run some of that out into the, from both sides, run it in this way, make sure I have plenty in there. Now I've also many times done this, many times isn't the right word, and wound up with a little bit of epoxy down in, I don't want to take that out yet, down in the, uh, in the tube itself, so that's another thing to try to be careful of. to minimize that if we can. And you see I got some in there now. Nice tight fit. Clean this up. This helps move the epoxy all around too. Gives you two little benefits for the price of one. I want to get all of the extra off. Let's move the camera. You can see there's a bunch on the outside here. While we're babysitting this, Obviously, we're going to do one at a time. You want to keep this one 90 degrees down. And by the way, the Uniflow one, you want to face dead forward on the inside of the fuselage, if possible. Now, I did vents where both of them came out the bottom on the Red Baron, and years later, I, years later, after flying it and getting disgusted with the motor runs, I put the vent in the right spot. This is the right spot as far as I can tell right now for this this type of setup, stunt run setup. Uniflow facing forward, not both on the bottom. The ones on the bottom of the fuselage never worked as well as the ones facing forward. You know, I'll just babysit that one while the epoxy's kicking off. The epoxy goes into cheese. You can still make little fine adjustments. 
And it's a question now of just babysitting this. We'll let it dry and then we'll put a second coat of epoxy inside. What I'm going to do is mix up a second batch of epoxy and put some little carbon fiber toe in it. I'll chop up some little toe to make like a paste. Put a little black dye in it and then give this a second coat so that the little toe that's in there will help stiffen this up and make a real nice fillet. May seem like overkill, but if you have a vent come out on Nationals Top 5 Day or something, you'll be so glad you spent a little time doing this. Yeah, scissors are dull. Substitute for having some sharp scissors. See what I'm just doing is making some little strips. Nothing too fancy. You could use e-glass, you could use carbon, whatever you just happen to have laying around. You take the big pieces out. And this makes a real nice paste. Boy, is this strong when this dries. You just put this right over the epoxy joint before it dries. Oh, what's real handy here is a Q-tip, of course, or a, in this case a toothpick. You can build up a little fillet. You could also, if you wanted to, put a washer inside here and just epoxy it in. I don't think that's really, really necessary. This is a good system, though. This is something, and boy, I have seen many, many people very frustrated by the fact once you fly the plane, you can't get decent tank vents in because the wood gets all soaked. Once some oil gets in there, you're kind of too late jolly. I'm just building up a nice little blob of epoxy here. try to do is start off the flying season with an old tank, a tank that's been used. Hopefully that would mean it's clean. I took this one, which had been about a year old, ran some fuel through it. We're going to get a tank from Woody Midgley with a baffle, and we do have some big gym tanks, so obviously we're going to be doing some testing, but for right now, just make sure I have plenty of clearance around here. I'll start with the tank. Let's see, I've got an inch of clearance here. You know, start with the tank all the way back for now and shim it up off the mounts roughly a sixteenth to start. I like to make like two or three, of the, I use everything sixteenth sheet and at least one or two of them out of plywood with a little tongue on them so I can get them in and out. That's important too. Because what you've, if you've never packed all the tank shims in and then had tried to get them out, forget it. In balsa wood you grab it with pliers and it doesn't come out. So that last one I'll make up, or any one, it doesn't matter which, but it'll have a a little tongue and it'll be a, a 16th plywood. So I want to get this to where the last one is kind of a press fit. And then I know I'll make, I need three shims all together. I'll just make this one up out of plywood with a tongue and I'll have it. I'm trying to do here, this is kind of a little experiment. I don't know if this is going to even work. I have this material, it's end grain balsa with composite, some kind of fiberglass on top and bottom, but it's end grain. So you would think it wouldn't compress as much. I got a big sheet of this from Ed Gallagher about a year ago, and I'm trying to figure a way I can make, since I need one piece. See what will happen, the eighth inch will either be on the top or the bottom, and the other piece will be sixteenth. So if I put a, you always, I don't even bother with less than a sixteenth unless I'm really fine tuning a thousand flights into the plane. Right now, if I can get a sixteenth on the bottom, the eighth inch shim on top, I don't know if I can do this though. But if it's too, oh no, perfect. Hey, for once we luck out. Okay, now I can tell where that tongue has to be. And I can go trim it up. Oh, this looks like it's going to work just fine. But you need that little tongue on there to pull a sucker out. Now it's it's even loose, so what I'm going to have is I'll get a piece of 30 second plywood now. But because this is end grain, this will really be nice and strong. This is really going to be a nice way to do this. 
And again, this is what the material looks like when you buy it. It's made to make bolts. It's in grain. You can see all the bolts is in there in grain. And we have this for over a year. I never found anything to really do with it. But, but what happened, number one, this is fuel proof. Number two, I could drill some holes in here. I can, I can X this out or whatever because this is such rigid material. An experiment. I guess what I'm going to try to do, I'm going to try to get some lightning holes in this. I'm just thinking, I, you know, I had this for so long and I couldn't find anything to really do with it. This, this will really be a good way to do this. I'm, I'm so impressed. And what will happen is then I'll have on the bottom, I'll have a 16th and a 32nd. And if I want to shim, then I can either do this or then I can hit. See, you only need one an eighth, one a 16th and one a 32nd. And then you can, in combination, you can vary the tank by putting any combination top and bottom. You don't need 800 one sixteen shims. So this will be, and because it's it's not compressible, it'll probably add some strength. Now, once I know exactly where this is going to be shimmed, I might even want to glue this in, if I can still get the tank in there. But that gives me just one more of those options that I'm always looking for. I can lay this out in such a way so I know where that's going to be pressing on. And it won't be symmetrical. Now I want to get it that it's the same up in the front here. See, you never know when you're going to come up with some one of these little great inventions. And even if it doesn't work, so what? We'll go make some balls or apply with shims. So that's the area at which the tank will actually rest down. I don't want to put any lightning there. Yeah, I can come up with any pattern of lightning holes here. It doesn't even matter. But this is the area that I don't want to lighten. Anything that's, that's on the tape... go over to the jigsaw and just just cut each one, each one of these out individually. Well, this worked out pretty good and again it's just one other thing we can experiment with. Doesn't work. It's not a big deal. When you experiment with parts that you can just take on and off the plane it's not really high risk. What's high risk is when you make a part that's not really easy to change on a plane. So for the first couple of flights anyway and until we get the real tank from Woody. Then this one, see the object here is this tank will then become a backup tank for this plane and I'll have the shim. I'll know exactly where it'll be shimmed and I'll mark that and put it right on the, the tank itself. Anyway, that the thick side goes where the baffle goes. So I don't forget which is the thick side. I think I can still get in. I know a sixteenth isn't going to fit. A sixteenth is too much. So I'll make this up out of thirty second, and I should have it. Well, it's a question of just connecting up the tubes. Now, one suggestion I have, and I guess I don't have any. Always this red Prather tubing. I have a roll of it somewhere. i got to find it. The best tubing. The least likely to give you a problem with the whole air leaks and everything, but always new tubing. Beginning of every season, new tubing, new filter, new handle, and new cable handle, and new set of lines. And it's really cheap insurance. Boy, it's a lot cheaper than building a new plane, that's for sure. Now, one of my golden rules is never put a new engine in a new plane. And I'm, this is an engine that's got two seasons on it. So what I'm going to do is get this in for the initial runs. It's going to be in and out 50 times before I shim the tank and get everything ready. Get a tongue muffler on here, just so I can get a little preliminary balance on it. For the beginning thing here, I'll put a gasket on it. At the end of 10 or 15 runs, that gasket will be gone. I just like it on there to keep the nose clean. Let's see if we can fish in the tubing here, see how much we have to cut off. we got to cut a little bit off. Now one of the problems you can always have here is the filter will have a, or whatever you want to call it, the tubing will be lower or higher than the motor or have a bend in it. You want to have a nice straight run if possible. I always like to do on a new model is seal this. This is a piece of the next size bigger tubing just like a little ring on there. 
I just feel that, uh, you know, until the model is new and everything, all the, the little shakeout things are going on, this filter is going to come on and off a hundred times by the time we're finished with this. But that gives me a little bit of security. Actually, you could put that on all the joints if you wanted to. Just a little safety security system. Okay. This is the way the OS needles come stuck. I, they put a little dot in there. I like to put a real, a real uh, mark in there. I guess because my eyes are so bad. And this will be for, just take a parting wheel, cut a mark in there. It gives you a little bit of a head start on finding the needle system because basically we're only going to have a, a click in or a click out hopefully once this is set up right. And all I do is smear in some either red or orange or whatever color paint just so that stands out. It, when you go in a click, a click, a click, it's really, at least just for me, uh, a little bit of a little bit clearer way of seeing it. Oh, there's the phone again. Okay, you got it all up on the table. Now, a couple of things. Of course, this is Robert Sabatino's Nobler, 52 Nobler, and he did a couple little experiments, which I... Now, tell me again, this is water-based urethane. Right. Over tissue. Tissue over water-based urethane, and then we ran into one problem. You can't recoat this. You only have a three-hour time window to do this. This is epoxy. What the hell's I can? Epoxy finish. So he ran what I suggested he do. Run a little test. Check it out. And it looks like now you know how you could check this too. You could paint on this a third time and see. Yeah. But they tell you to recoat in three hours, and it did wrinkle up just like like this can says if you wait more than three hours so you can forget about that but we can't we came up with what we hope is going to be a solution he, he wants to make an authentic 52 noble paint job where i think the wing tips are one color and the nose if i remember right the whole nose is one color so you'll have to paint that first do the urethane and the tissue the same way see he can't paint in the house it's a problem so and it looks like we're at the end of our painting with karen around here too so we're trying to come up with something that'll be reasonable anyway, or that'll be a very quick light finish for somebody that's doing profiles. Anyway, this will be a good choice. If you paint this, let's say it's white, let it dry overnight, back mask this, and then, but, but at no point in time put one coat of paint over the other. I think that'll do it. Because I was thinking we could get like a, a pencil line, you know, like an Exactly. Line and then put the a piece of, yes, yes. So you have that space. And the name of this is Color Works Epoxy Enamel. So more on this as, put that in your box. We'll find out. We'll know in a week or so. I'm hoping we're going to be able to finish this up tonight. We got all the shelves ready to glue on, the tails ready to glue on. I guess the next thing is get the plans out and let's make the push rod up. Let's make the push rod and get it assembled. Put the push rod in there. Nothing special. We're not going to put a fair lead in there yet. But we're using a little piece of, of twig, really, a little piece of scrap wood to line up the flaps. Get a, pick the other edge up, Robert, and let's see if the other side is neutral. Can you see the line on your side? Yes. It's okay, we want to be, let's look right down there and see that that's a neutral. Now once that's in neutral, let that wood lock it, and now we just got to put the elevators in neutral and we can tack it in place. Okay, but the main thing is to hold this in place while you're working back here. Now by sliding this back and forth, you can find neutral, and then we want to measure that the hinge lines go hinge line to hinge line, nice and equal. Now we've sighted this from the front. And this is the high side, so we want to maintain the level and just sand just this one side. You got sandpaper there? Where's that little sanding bra? Just put a couple of swipes on that until we get it until we get it even. You know, you're only probably going to need two or three swipes to get it. Just the high side. See, as we're sighting it from here, this side the tail was up just a little bit, so we don't want to sand both sides. We just want to sand the high side. Let's see what it looks like now. Another shot, same amount. That's half of it. Still high? No, I would say it's either perfect or that side might be a fraction. All right. Tail is perfect. That's close enough. Real good. Okay, now you want to get hinge line to hinge line. Get that the ruler right here it is. Well, let's get the hinge line to hinge line. Now what we'll do, we'll put some, some epoxy on this and some pins so you can move it a little bit. We'll turn around the other 
you want to do is let the ruler hit the flap hinge line and look at the hinge line. Okay, it's 35 and a half, right? Okay, now you want to do the same the same measurement at the other side. Put your finger here. I mean, we'll have a little variation here. This is just so we're not off by an inch. Uh, 35, 5 plus. So we'll go. That's perfect. That's okay. right there. Okay, so now you're flat straight up and down, and you've got it that? Yeah. It's, it's close. Okay, let's get some epoxy mixed. You brought epoxy? Well, let's use up my old stuff first. Okay. And get plenty on there. Don't fool around. Okay, well, this is drying, and we can see what Kenny's got to do on his Nova. Okay, you got it. All right, you got it. Okay, try to lay that in now with the with the elevator is kind of neutral. Now, it looks like on this side the flap is a little up. All right, well we could fine tune that part. That part I'm not worried about. Okay. Get that level again. Somebody might have walked into it. Get the flaps level first. Right there. Okay, the flaps are level. There's level there. Let's see what you got here, Robert. Up. That's up. Put it down just a little bit. That looks good. See, that looks a bit down to me. Okay, well, you're right, you're right. Okay. Stab right. should go forward, just the 64th of an inch. Okay, now we'll get some of those real small pins. Those John Pothia pins. Last, the last box. Pull it by, don't let it drop on the floor like I did before. Yeah, the little pins with the blue heads. These here? Green heads, yeah. Okay. Just put one on each side for now. And then we'll line up. We need to check hinge line to hinge line. Yeah, no, one on each, this is just to hold it. Now I want to check hinge line to hinge line. And get this out of here before somebody puts their elbow in it. I'm probably going to put this one up here too. Yeah, put them both in there. You're going to take them in and out yeah, 20 times out. before you're done. It just looks a little easier to do it up there. Okay, now get your hinge line to hinge line measurement. Well, that's drying. As soon as you're comfortable with that, put about 10 more pins in it and we'll put it aside to dry. Okay. You remember the measurement you had before? It's about 35 and a half, right? Okay, so this one's 37 now, so this side has to... Your side has to come in, so take one pin out. And just move Ooh. it to your back. Oh. How's that? Right there. Okay. Now go back to the other side. And then it sprung, so... Okay, but you can do this over and over again. You really got about 10 minutes before that epoxy is going to start jelloing out on you. See, now what's nice is if you knew before, Ken, what the measurement was when they were equal, right. you have a head start because now you know it's not 37. Hold on. Yeah, that looks like 35 uh, oh. and just a hair. So. Okay, check the other side. This is 36, no? And that happened. No, that looks to me like, uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, well, here, let me check mine again. Probably now, if you're in doubt, a good way to do this is put a little piece of tape on a ruler and put a mark, a pencil mark. This way you're not referencing a number, you're referencing a mark. You're in front of the mark or behind the mark. Put a little piece of tape on a ruler. That's always a good trick. Take a pen. This is a fine pen. And then you'll either note it, you have to go ahead of it or behind it, one or the other. Okay, now I'm right at the inside of this hinge, right? There. Okay, put a little scratch on it. Okay, and that is, now that little mark, I want to put another mark here. Okay. So if you, uh, and just, just barely butting this up against the wing, the hinge is... Look at how your rulers go. Yeah, the angle, well, obviously, the, the ruler has to be 90 degrees. Down. You can't press down, you have to bend the ruler, right? How, how, how come yeah, you want to keep the tail. Off. You want to keep the tail straight. You don't want to push the tail down. That's another thing. Maybe we should start from scratch. <laughs> start from scratch. you got plenty of time. This, is, this epoxy's not going to kick off in two, you know, 10 seconds. 
This is one of the things. I know what to do. We didn't have the elevators dead neutral before. Okay, we'll get them dead neutral. That looks like dead okay. neutral to me. Okay, and check. Okay, check that you have the flaps dead neutral on the elevators. Flaps are right. Okay. Put one or two pins in. All the pin is there just so it doesn't fall off. Let's not put any pins. And if you know where your mark is, now you're a little bit ahead of the game. Okay, so you're on mark. See, this really gets to be a son of a gun if you got an airfoil tail, Robert. You understand why? If you had an airfoil tail, now you got to be sanding each time you make a change. Okay, so this side has to come. We have to turn it uh, there. Let's try that. Okay, okay, as soon as you think you have it. Now, the only other adjustment is you, you got to make sure. It, you measure it, because this way you could. Before you make you know a final I mean? decision yeah. here, yeah. this has to be in the middle. And you're not in the middle, so this has to go, the whole tail has to go over to this side. See, so otherwise the horn is, there you go, right here, right there, that's good. Otherwise the horn will hit. Okay. Okay, let's try again. We're going to go this way a little bit. That okay, line. so now we're right on. Same. You're right on the money? Okay. No, not yet. No, no, no. Not now, just all you have to do while we're working on Kenny's plane is just keep an eye on it. Sight from the nose down. Make sure nothing moves. we got pins in the tail. And the epoxy will 15, 20 minutes. It'll be nice and rock hard. And we can go on and put all the decks and turtle decks and everything on here. Okay, Ken, you want to clear the table? And we'll get the other one out. Oh, this is really coming out nice. You got three more coats on this, right? That was the last thing we talked about? Yeah, I got um, I had two or three coats of clear. I've been going over all the rib caps a zillion times. Yep. Yeah, I can feel. That's nice. And uh, then all of this has a coat of filler that's been sanded. Okay. Uh, oh, that's nice. You can't really feel any. I, that's perfect. That doesn't need any more. No, no, I'm no. wondering if, I, if these are good enough or whether these need more fill. This needs a coat of clear. You can still feel the tissue. One coat of spray clear on that. Okay, now this has filler that hasn't been sanded. And that you need, what you should do is sand that and spray one coat of clear on it. Okay. Actually, if you wanted to, what you could do is wait till the plane is all in one piece, uh -huh. and then do it all at one time. Do all what? Do the last coat of clear before you put silver on. Do the whole thing. You can put it in silver now, or you can, you know what I'm saying? But are these, I'm wondering if these parts are ready for clear, or do they need more filler? A coat of clear, no, a coat of clear. In fact, we could do one right now. Let's okay. hold it up and see. We could do one right now outside. It's warm enough. Put some silver on one of these. the case, what I'd like yeah, to let's do put some silver on, and the worst that happens is you, you just sand it off. That's all. Maybe we can sand this and... Boy, this day turned out to be pretty good. How's Paint King doing out here? All right, let's see this fool. Hey, that doesn't look bad. Now, even the Julia would be impressed by this. All right, if you're going to... If you're too far away, nothing bad happens. So be too far away first. Put the put the this over your shoulder. Otherwise, even you won't be able to hold it. There you go. Ammo belt over. Ammo belt. Be too far away. It's okay. And if you give it ten coats, it's better than getting a run. Ten light coats is better than having a run. Okay. All right. Don't don't overdo it. You can come back. I can still see through it. So. Okay, but but you don't want to get a run. Then it's a pain in the neck. So we'll stop right there. Okay. Now get. What else did you have out here? You got these parts. I have another. Um, oh, we got to find a place to put some of this stuff. You can't put it back in the house now. I don't want to stink old Karen out. Let's put it in the garage. I don't have enough hands. <laughs> put one. Out, put one on the top of your head. <laughs> The human stooge! <laughs> so Karen turned on the microwave before and we got baby birds inside the house. They're in our microwave vent. As soon as you turn the microwave on, you yeah. they made a nest right in that vent. You see that, Bob? Yeah. Unbelievable. The Jays are on the other side of the driveway. So we got a we got a sign on our microwave. We can't use it until these baby birds grow up. Because I know if you touch them, the mother has a fit. In this thing, there's a mess of J's that you can see, the, I don't know if you can see from here. The Papa J is in there every morning. Man, when we're having coffee, he's going nuts. Yeah. Look at that backyard fence. Oh, is he ready to paint again? He's paint. All right, paint king.
A lot of light coats are always better than... Ah. You're, you're not going to cover with dope in one coat. I always do. I've been doing this since I was a kid. Now, why do you think this is better than just using a spray can? They're really cheap. You don't have to listen to the noise. This little fixture. Yeah, you gotta make better fixtures. Next time you uh, engineer something up, you gotta have... I see what's hurting you here is the fixturing. And the fact the wind is howling. Work them in. So what we did, we put chain lube on the connectors. Notice all the push rods face outward. And he's out there painting his little heart and soul away. And you'll see it'll work. This just lets the chain lube soak right in. Give it a minute or so and then we'll start buttoning up the top of the sky. Yeah, he's looking good. This is going to be a nice plane. It's nice and white too. a little fair lead with a slot going this way and a slot going that way and when you put them both together that keeps the push rod hold it now pull full up okay see now you, the push rod doesn't bend when you go to push down it's called a little fair lead eighth inch light ply is good now put a little bit of that chain lube on there get the chain lube put one drop on there so it where should it, I put it right right in the front and right in the back yeah and then work the controls again and put a little bit in the back. And then we're ready to start putting the top and bottom on. Okay. Oh, those controls are nice. Fat city. What do you got? Trouble with the gun, Ken? Yeah, it's got plenty of pain in it. All right, hold on. This is done with thick CA. Do about a two-inch spot at a time. And kick it with Q-tips. And just press it in. Now watch, that block is kind of thin. Now work your way down another two inches. And don't worry if a little bit hangs out. You can sand that in. We'll take it out on the deck. It's nice out there. Sand it right in. And then we'll do the turtle deck. And just go two inches at a time. The whole thing is to do with the Q-tips. If you do with kicker, you can never get that joint nice. The joint turns to popcorn and, you know, Rice Krispies and everything yeah. else. That gets these little voids in it. Yeah. That, uh, it makes bubbles that you can never get out in the final finish. It's almost impossible. And you stumble over them forevermore. So now, you know, anytime that gun doesn't want to spray, you want to clean the nozzle and clean that little air bleed hole and that's it. Alright. Alright, as soon as this kicks, let's take it outside and sand that joint. Because it'll be easier to sand than after you get the turtle deck on. Now, once you get the turtle deck on, it's going to be a nuisance to sand that. Okay. Now you want to seal that edge so there's no way no way that oil can get back in there. Just get a nice bead of thick right along the edge. See, if you use thin, you'll get it all in your blind nuts and everything. And then, obviously, when we paint the plane, that needs to get, you know, fuel-proofed. Get a good bead in there. Use the Q-tips. Okay, super. Okay, now that's the piece we made from the Spitfire mold. Now, obviously, you see what we're going to have to do is notch it out for the for the stab. So get a nice, where's that pen we were using before? And mark where that's going to have to be notched. You know, you're going to have to make a quarter inch notch for this. We also put a little bit of dap up on the nose just to kind of fill in where, where it was sanded thin and stuff. Now, should we just butt up against it? Yeah, butt up against the front. Hold it there. Now mark where that quarter inch is going to have to come out. You just mark the front and the back. 
and it will take a quarter inch out of there. And I'll show you a real easy way to take a quarter inch out. You put quarter inch tape on there and just cut it right out. Yeah, make sure you get a good joint up in the front. See, if you don't get it, if you don't get it good up in the front, it's going to be a problem. And when you put the canopy on, it's not going to line up right. Dude, if you just mark the front and the back, then we'll lay a piece of quarter inch tape in there, because this is quarter inch wood, and you'll be able to use that for your little pattern, and it'll be exactly the same on both sides at once. All you need is the front, Robert, the front mark, and the back on both sides. Okay, and now just move it up. Now look, here's a good way you can do this. Take the T-square. Let me get you the T-square. Lay the T-square on there. And just let the lines come up. No, no, the other way around. Lay the T-square this way. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Okay, give yourself a little more than a quarter of an inch. And then we'll lay out a piece of tape on there. And the tape will give you the line. Kenny must be painting away out there, boy. He's burning up my compressor. That's it. Just extend those lines up. There you go. Do the same on the back. See, that gives you a nice 90 degree edge when you do it that way. Just lay that, make sure it's parallel to the bottom. Okay. And then just run the pen down at it. Make sure it's pressed down. If you need a new piece, take a new piece. You really don't get to use the tape 14 times. But that's quarter inch tape, and we're going around a quarter inch tail, so it should be pretty, pretty close. And don't forget, we got to cut through glass cloth. There's cloth in the middle of this. It's a real nice way to do it. I'm sure an old Drindak could be just saying, oh, well engineered, Arnowski. Okay, take that off. That gives you your little piece. Now you just got to cut that out, get a brand new scalpel blade, and that should be a real close fit for that. Should be able to get the turtle deck on in five minutes here. Ooh, you're cutting through that glass cloth, so just get the first two notches, and then take that, that little blade, score it, because you're going to get down to the glass cloth in one shot. And you're going to have to go back. Do you feel the cloth in there? Yeah, you'll know. And once you get through that, it'll just go right through. Little imperfection. Get, a, get that soft piece a quarter inch and make like a little wedge to, to go in there. And then we need to make a little 1 shim in here. And we can tack that in, and then we can take that outside and sand that joint. Get that one roughed in. Hey, it's looking like a nobler at last. A little patch like this, what you want to do is you want to make a little wedge. And it doesn't have to be real fancy. You know that it's... Okay, so you wouldn't make the hole bigger. No. You just take a corner. Now that's like a wedge. Like a cork in a bottle. Yeah. Let it stick out plenty. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Pretty high tech, huh? Where's that the thing glue? Okay, just hit this with the thing glue. Hit it with the Q-tips, there you go. Okay, now you want to make the same kind of wedge with a little bit of an angle for this back piece here too. Same thing. So you, what you want to do is just take a piece Measure the length, cut it on a 45 degree angle, so it's like a triangle. Okay. This is block sanded in, you'll never even see it. All you need it, it just to look like almost like a wedge. Just so it sticks out just a little bit. It's a little bigger and you can just kind of force it in. Same as with that little patch.
just take enough material away that that'll slide right in. And it will dress the whole trailing edge off in one shot. Just take a little more each time you go. This way you have a nice, like a furniture joint, instead of having a, uh, if you just glue the rudder right on top, no strength. You don't have any strength that way. Even if it takes eight, ten times, don't worry about it. a little bit at a time. You don't want to really make it any bigger than it has to be. Look at those nail files. These nail files are okay. Yeah, okay. That. Okay, okay, now don't don't push it all the way down. Just want about an eighth of an inch sticking in and I want to line this angle up here. Okay, now look at it from the front the same way you looked at the tail and try to get it level. You know, you don't want to tip in one way or the other when you hit it with glue, because once you glue it, you're not going to be able to unglue this. Perfect to me. Looks perfect. Who the hell do you think you are? <laughs> you bum. Okay, tack it then. Just put one drop of glue. <laughs> you look at it first. No, nah, glow it. I think we got to move it back a little bit. Okay, but you want to line this line up, because we're going to run a sanding block down it. So, yeah, put a little ruler on that, and then we'll just clip that little thing off, that little tail. Okay. Okay, now we just gotta trim that back and sand it down. Just get that back sand. Now what I can do, cut this piece out. See, we can split this now, because this is too thick. We can split this, cut this piece out, and pinch this back together so it's all nice and thin, and then just dress that all off with a sanding block. Do that, I want to do that outside though. I don't want to make all that dust in here with Karen. Any place you see you have a dent, and that, by the way, is the stuff that you do sheetrock work with that's not uh, light dap or anything. Any place just it take five minutes or I see out on a wingtip you got some dents here too? Smear some on. And take some of that home with you when you go. There you go. You give that, by the time we're done eating, that'll be dry, you can sand it out. And there's a spot right in the back where that sand it out. Just put a little... Right here. Yeah, right in there. Pinch a little bit in there. You didn't bring a plane, Jim? Nah, I've got a doctor's appointment later. Oh, okay. You want to do some food, or... I want to clean up here a little bit so he doesn't get... We've got to work on the bottom of it. Okay, we got the gear mount in, needless to say, eighth inch plywood. Cross grain on the bottom. I'm gonna leave a little piece up here to make when we do make the cow like a like a typical cardinal cow instead of a nobler. And even though this is not the way a nobler normally is, for Robert's purposes, this will be just fine. He's not looking to uh, the beat Lou roll gas or something with this. It's just gonna be a fun plane anyway, and this will be fine. Okay, he's got pretty much. Now what we're going to do, he's not going to sand this out here because Karen's having another attack with the dust mites up there. So we're going to pack this in tonight, but it basically is in one piece. Gear are ready to go on. Let's just get an idea. That's perfectly smooth. That looks nice. That's going to be good. The only thing you got, what, two or three sheets back here and we're all done. So it took you three nights to make this nobler. Now, come on, that's... I know guys can do it in two. And Peabody, but two. No, that's good. That's looking good. Okay, the three-day nobler, the amazing three-day nobler. Okay, now we got to get Midgley to make a canopy. That's one thing. Well, if, if John has something that's even close, I don't know. Let's see what else we have down here. Can't make a cowling until we decide if that K&B is going to be too heavy. I have this, the feeling it is going to be. All right, but for three days, I guess this is not a bad plane.
There's a lot of guys can't do this in three days, you know. Don't don't be uh, too disappointed. Now, in tonight's mail, this is unbelievable. Dan Hume from Denmark, of course, is building a cardinal kit. And he came up with this little technique, and he, he wrote it out for me about how to put his uh, lettering on with black tissue. Of course, sends me a couple pictures of the cat. And he's laying out his trim job, I guess, here. And this is, I'm trying to determine what this is. He bought a bunch of candy apple paint, so I hope he's going to have a really exotic paint job. Yeah, I guess there it is. What he's trying to do here with the tissue, colored tissue to save weight. Look at the pile of stuff in the back. Anyway, from Denmark, anyway. And what he did somehow, he I'm trying to figure out. I've, I've read it several times. He, he made a Xerox copy of this and then put it onto black tissue paper. Anyway, what I did, I wrote him a letter. I asked him to please write it up for crash repairs so we can, you know, share it maybe uh, in a more detailed way, and I think he'll do that. Dan, thanks a lot for the idea, and let me get over there and work on you. Okay, anybody, anybody's going to laugh when I show him this. Here's our first broken cannon. I was carrying the plane in, leaned over, and boom. The cannon broke exactly like I thought it would. In fact, the only damage is to the cannon itself, which is exactly what I wanted to happen. So we suffered our first broken cannon, and uh, it shows why I uh, looks like I made the right move, making them removable. But what I'm going to do is get in there with a, an X-Acto knife and unscrew that piece, kind of just tack glue it together, because again, I want them to break. I want them to break and not the, not the actual wing of the plane get torn apart. So that looked like it... It worked as we planned. Talk about, I wish I could take credit for some well-engineered thing, but not really. What I take credit for is being lucky. Sometimes being lucky is just as good. And I need to get this piece, figure out exactly how this would go back. But it broke exactly, uh, I guess, in the way it was supposed to. And it looks like I'm missing a piece here. Making these, <laughs> making these removable has proven to be a, uh, a good investment in my sanity anyway. Now what I always try to do when I'm going to set this up is at least two and a half ounces of tip weight in the start. I always want to start off on the high side. In fact, I need to get, I need to drill these out. See the stock weights don't come drilled for a 632 bolt. And I want to make sure, now what Joe did, and it's real nice, let me just show this. He made this, that it's a perfect fit for the half inch weights fit right in there perfectly. The first weight, I drill a hole exactly the size of the nut so it can kind of lock the nut in place. And talk about things that can ruin your whole day. A piece of tip weight loose, rattling around in the tip, Oh man, chew, can chew the whole tip up in one stroke of the pen. Okay, that takes care of this. Now believe it or not, here I go to all this trouble today. I get to the end of the day, I look in the mail, and Woody Midgley sent me my number one tank. So I think what I'm going to do is switch tanks here. I always want to have a backup tank, but I'd like to have at least start off the thing with Woody's tank instead of the one that I picked up here, which is an older one. It's probably full of junk, too. Now, it's usually about this time every year that I have to get kind of... You get really friendly with a plane. You get to know all the little idiosyncrasies of taking it apart and putting it back together. And I guess one of them is going to be to take those cannons off whenever I'm working on it. That's for sure. Now the other, the other couple little things I want to get used to. Each nose section comes apart just a little bit differently. I want to get used to all the little things that make each one just a little bit different. So now I actually have in-house, I have both of my tanks. 
I hope I'm going to get one more motor before the season starts. But even if I don't, I have some that are in the planes, and I'm sure we'll get through the season. But each time you do a nose section, it just comes apart just a little bit differently, and this screw doesn't fit in this hole, and there's always some nonsense to deal with. But I guess that's what makes it kind of cool. Each one is just a little bit different. They're just like children in a family. They're all, uh, you know, they all look like grandpa, but all just a little bit different. What I like about this nose section in particular is that I can get the engine in and out without disturbing the needle valve setting, which is just one little free bonus. This fuselage is a little bit wider than the Spitfire, and so getting the engine in and out, there's a little more room for the wrenches and filters and tubing. Everything is not really as confined. And usually after taking it apart and putting it back together four or five times, it's your friend or it's your worst enemy. Really nice is when it's done right. It really is a pleasure to work on it. Now one of the things I always have to be careful of is not to let this slip and bump into the nose ring. That's one of the things in the past that I've chinked the nose ring up. Now last year we had these little gear mills made up. Well, there was only one problem was the gear legs were on the short side and I never really was happy with the amount of prop clearance. And what I wanted to do is rather than just extending the wire, I want to make up a whole new set of gear legs for the sea fire. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to do this in a roundabout way. What I'm going to do is make a complete set with all the details on in wood and all the, uh, the sanding and finishing, so actually it'll be a set of gear I can use. And then if it turns out, and again, this is, this is the next step up, I can always make more short gear with that mold. When I have it, where I really am happy with the way it take off, takes off and lands, especially at the circle burner field where we'll be doing most of the flying, the longer gear legs can go forward just a little bit. The last year's plane used to have a little tendency to nose over in the rough grass. This, I hope, is going to be a little up and a little upgrade. And what it's going to also give me is two different styles of landing gear. Then when I'm all done and the plane is test flown and everything is working exactly as planned, I can take the gear legs off the plane, make up another little rubber mold, and I'll have it exactly the way I want it. Now the advantage of that is, and I didn't get a chance to do that last year because of the time schedule, what's what an advantage it is when you can go fly the plane ahead of time and make sure you've got the angle right and all, everything is exactly the way you want it. It's really nicer to do it that way before you make the mold. Because obviously the original part doesn't get hurt. You just take it off, mold off it, and <laughs> wipe it off and put it back. So the, the plan is to change just a little bit. Then I'll always have the short gear legs and I'll also then at the end of this time frame I'll have gear legs that are about a half an inch longer for running bigger props and flying off of grass. Mainly the flying off grass thing. Now the first step is I want to bend up a set of wires and this is really a test wire. Make sure this length is not too long or it winds up poking through the top of the wing. I have that already fixtured up. The legs themselves are a half inch longer and it'll allow me to move the gear even a little bit more forward. It'll also give me one other variation that I don't have right now is if I want to adjust the vertical CG I can do it with longer gear as well as heavier wheels. I can, I can have two options. I might bend wire and I'm really not uh, the world's best wire bender but <laughs> one of the things I've learned is it's always good to make a piece. Now from this piece just make a piece at random that's close. I want to make this leg a little bit longer, just maybe an eighth of an inch longer. And I also want to make sure when I'm done, both of these legs here are exactly identical. So one of the things I start off with, I always start with a, you know, a test piece, let's just say. You always have to allow about a quarter of an inch. In this case, I want to get this length here. 
what I've done in the past is mark this with a little dead stop. If I was going to make 8, 10, or 15, like when I'm going to make cardinal landing gear, I can do it that way. Now in this case, I can make this just a little bit longer. It won't even matter because I can trim it off. Always bend a little bit and never, the, the trick is here, never to go bending it back and forth, back and forth 15 times. You'd like to bend it one time. There's a dead stop on here for 90 degrees. Now it should be just a little bit longer. Let's see how close I've gotten it. Okay, now what I'll do is when I actually insert that into the model, I'll trim that to fit. Now I need to get the next bend. Now I know that's where I want the bend. So I'm going to add roughly, and I have this, but you can tell I really know what I'm doing. Well, roughly a quarter of an inch, and I want to make that leg just a little bit longer. So I've, I've just done this by interpolation. See to the pants is the word I like. And if you play around with a little bit of wire, look at that, exactly right. I want it at an eighth of an inch longer. I've got an eighth of an inch. Now I want to do the same thing with the leg down here. And it's a good idea. Of course, I want to make mirror images. Even if you have to bend eight, ten pieces of wire to do this, it might help if I did it the right way. It's really not a big deal because wire is cheap. Now i got to reverse it. Just a little bit more. Just a little bit less than a quarter of an inch. I've measured this out, but I can kind of do it by eye. And let's see, one of the parameters, I got the leg length exactly right. I wanted that a little bit wider. I've got that wider. And I'm okay down here. This length I just trim off. So that's one wire. Now I'll keep the pattern. I'll just bend another wire and make sure I have a mirror image of everything before I go to the next step. Now one of the things this the C fire has the gear a lot closer in than the Spitfire. So and in fact they're longer and I can move them forward. I'll have a lot more options here. Now one of the things I mentioned before. Don't make this arm too long. I've I don't even want to admit it, but I have pushed this through on wire that I wasn't checking and pushed it right out the top of the wing. The other thing too to consider is there's always paint in these grooves. And what I like to do is just take the wire and maybe even I'll sharpen up a piece of eighth inch wire just to scrape out some of the paint so I get a nice tight fit. I want to show another thing on here that I ran into with the Spitfire. Let's get this pushed in. Let's get the wire to come out just in the middle, just for cosmetic purposes. Now see, this is rocking on the wire. I have to grind out some of that paint. And this one here, same thing. Is to try to get it to exit at right in the center of that before I go on and get all the final bends in the wire. I think it's going to look a lot more scale with the gear closer together. So well is one of these little bits that has the little teeth carved in it. Rather than getting too aggressive, I'll just do it. What happens, glue and paint get in here, and then those doors don't want to sit nice and flat. Same thing with the tip weight box, of course. Okay, what I wanted to try to do is establish the angle forward. Now luckily I have the old Spitfire sitting up there so I can kind of copy that angle. And I know that was landed on grass. This will basically be the grass gear. And I'll use the short ones for concrete, the long ones for grass. The reason the long ones would let them move a little bit forward and still have the prop clearance. Now this is a 14.5. This, we're never going to use a 14 inch prop, but I still want to make sure even without the wheels that allows me to move, oh the phone's ringing, allows me to move it forward. Now what I'm trying to accomplish is to be able to have just a little, now see what would happen with the Spitfire, even with the longer of the two sets of gear, when I'd move them forward to where it would land in grass nice, I was losing a lot of prop clearance. So I, 
what, by having these a little bit longer, I can still move them just a little bit forward. In fact, I'm going to put a little more of a bend in it and still get the angle that I want. And then have the variation in having light wheels, heavy wheels. I can do a lot of var varying of the vertical CG. With this longer moment arm, it'll even be more sensitive. We would do this with wheels on anyway, but always to make sure you let go and that falls down. Now, we don't have a spinner and prop on here, but, but that's getting us close. When I get to this point, now I know it's going to be close. So I'm going to come forward maybe another half an inch or so, and then I'll get all the wires trued up and be ready to make up the, uh, the gear doors. Handy to have is a little machinist vice just for doing this kind of wire tweaking. Because I can get a reference looking down where that is. Looking down the wires, I've got the front one moved forward. Now I can just work off this as the reference and move this one so that they're both parallel. That's the first thing I have to get right is to get them both forward to pretty much the same amount. And then I can true up the axles. Okay, now those wires line up pretty well. You got that angle pretty well where I want it. And if in doubt, when you're making up grass gear, if in really, and you're just taking a stab in the dark, Lining up the axle pivot with the leading edge is a good starting point. Just a rough starting point, that would be a good one. Now the next step with the wires pressed down into the blocks is to get the, the wheels to track. And I like to, to tilt them just slightly toward turning into the circle, just a little bit. Now I also want to get them tweaked that they're straight this way. And this way they're way out. Okay, so what I'll do is take this one has to go back. The machinist vice is the handiest thing I can think of. And really what it takes is just going back and forth, back and forth. Look at this phone today. Those wires are all true. I run the ruler across them this way and they're true. And then I just try to get a little bit of an angle, just, geez, a hair of an angle that they're tilting in. Otherwise the plane, as soon as it lands, it cocks away from you. I also had to take the gear blocks and grind away a little bit of clearance because these are the grass gear and they're tilted forward. I don't want that cho chewing it up at the field. I want to have a little clearance there and I want to put some paint on that, of course, and fuel proof it. I just want to make sure all these alignments I want to be tilted in ever so little. I want to make sure I've got this angle right. They're not tracking off in left field somewhere. And that I'm lined up this way. And I can start laying out the gear doors. Now, a couple of things I like to do. I like to the, leave the part of the wire that you're going to see between the wing and where the gear door starts, but the rest of it, I like to put little knurls, little rough spots in the wire with the parting tool. It helps the wood and glue everything, whatever you're going to use here to get a better grip. Also, I can take some material off here just to lighten it up a little bit. Not really that important, but the torsion arm I want to leave exactly the same, and I want to make sure I don't have any kinks in this wire. Nice radiuses, smooth radiuses. I'll look at them real close with my glasses on. Every once in a while, you'll see when you bend a piece of 8th inch wire, it starts to split. Now, if that was to happen, and this gear went flopping up into the plane, well, obviously, you'd have some damage. You don't really want to do the last inch or so. Obviously, you just go right around the whole wire. All the murals on here, we have the wire lightened up a little bit up at this end. So it in effect, it becomes a little bit of an I-beam. This is not really totally significant. This is only because we're carrying around so many rockets and bombs and canopies. Now what I want to do, 
I want to lay this out. I want to enlarge it. See, the, the length is different. So I want to get the length here. I'm going to elongate everything by about an eighth of an inch just so I keep this in proportion. Remember, it's the proportion that I'm trying to achieve here. Now, I think an eighth of an inch is about all I'm going to be able to do, but I'm just sketching this out. And then I'll use the first one to make the, to use, this is 16 plywood, by the way. I'll use the first one. I don't want to make it any closer to the grass, because remember, these are grass gear. I'm just trying to verify that I have the length is right. And I, what I did, I laminated from the pattern, I laminated a piece up from three pieces of 64th plywood. So what I'll do now is just make a replica of this. Now you can see the difference in the size and the difference in the length, most of all. I did I want to, to try to simulate the the scale way that the deer the doors look. They do have a ridge on one side, they're perfectly flat on one side, and I guess that's the way the sheet metal comes together. So I did I took these are three pieces of sixty-fourth plywood and just laminated it right onto another piece and then traced around it and leaving that extra little bit. So it gives me that nice little ridge, kind of a scale looking ridge. You see, by gluing that right down there, now I can just trace this out and leave it an eighth inch like a window frame around there. It's a lot easier to do this than make two pieces and then try to line them up. Always make the first piece, glue it right down, and then, then make your extra little, uh, like, win I call it a window frame for lack of a better piece, lack of a better word. And that worked out pretty well. Of course, because they're mirror images, you always have to be aware that you have to make a right and a left. You can't just make two the same, just like fuse sides. Now, I want to get the wire. Next thing I want to do is I want to get the wire on here, but I want to get it on at exactly 90 degrees. So when I, I'm going to lay out a little ditch in here, a little notch, line this up where I want it, lay out a little ditch, tack glue this in, and then get this to be exactly 90 degrees before I put a final glue joint on there. Where I want that ditch to be based on the length of the axle, and I obviously this is one of the choices. You need one of the wheels. You don't want to have it look like that. You don't want to have it look like that. So by getting getting that position just right, and remember, the C fires and Spitfires all have the front piece hangs out a little further than the back. It's asymmetrical because of the way it goes back up into the wing on an angle. Now I use the rough to rough it out with the Dremel tool and I'll just get, this is just a half, a half moon recess in the wood. And so I just have that tacked on there, I can still once that tack dries, I'll run a bead of thin CA down there. I want to check that I have a little bit of clearance here, otherwise this, when this bends, it winds up whacking into the wing. Made sure I got my 90 degrees, and I can just make up the other one and get a permanent glue joint on this. What I want to do next, I want to take a piece of arrow shaft and try to simulate the actual gear leg. With a piece. We did it with the other one with a dowel. I think an arrow shaft will work too. Now what I did, I cut little pieces of, just little chunks of arrow shaft. I'm going to try to glue these in position to simulate the way the, the struts look on the real plane. I can just tack these on. All they are is I just cut a piece of arrow shaft, cut it in half to a little half moon. I can get what I think will be the scale position and then just glue these on. I want to take this down on the, the Dremel saw and slice it right in half so I have a complete half, a half circle. 
Life, a new label. Nutritional information is on the label. Boomer, the Okay, now I want to make the axle here, and I want to make the little scissors. Okay, what I did, I took a little piece of arrow shaft, put a little, little relief in one side, Now I'll just fill this up with thick CA. That'll give me a good, I guess, a simulation of a, an axle. And then I can adjust by grinding that away, I can adjust how much clearance I have between the gear door and the wheel. You can really just fine tune how far away from the door the wheel is this way without adding those copper washers or whatever, whatever the alternative to this is. And just make sure the thick CA soaks all the way in. I got some pictures back from our, this was our test day down in Middlesex with Mr. Awesome. Did the testing on that on the, uh, the tape before, that's for anybody who hasn't seen it. Anyway, you're going to be seeing this plane more and more. I hope we're going to even get to test the double star in here and uh, Joe's making up another tongue muffler. Some props, we, should, we might even get another test session this weekend. A really good flying plane, flew right off the board, couple little things, a little trim tab, little tank shim, and it was ready to rock. And this, of course, is a picture from uh, West the Coup when he came up here on Monday night and we had some pizza. Notice, notice he's taking the money from Ertnowski in his bribery trial, <laughs> soon to be played on HBO. Anyway, we hope he's going to help us in a lot of ways. Mainly, number one thing is to keep some of the flying sites and not lose any more. Now that we've officially lost Edison, we really want to, I don't know, be very aggressive about not losing any more flying sites. And we hope, Wes, I, I hope he's going to be instrumental. Thanks ahead of time, Wes. You're okay. I don't care what Jim Dameron says about you. Now, I was playing around here trying to figure out if this is exactly what I want to have before I make up the second one, but unfortunately this is another day of Karen having a doctor appointment, so we're going to cut this session short, probably finish this up tomorrow, maybe even get the gear painted. Anyway, this arrow shaft deal seems like it's going to work well, and keep in mind, one of the things I want to do is have a real nice finish on this, and have it as detailed as possible, because once I, once I Guarantee that these are going to be the gear I want to use. I want to be able to duplicate a set for everybody making a Spitfire, and I can do that very easily if I have a mold. If I ever get this molding rubber, my buddy, <coughs> my buddy in Florida Glue Products here promised me this rubber a month ago. Anyway, all right, we're going to pick this up tomorrow. See you then, Gonzos. Breaking thing that I, I forgot to mention here. Got to see this afternoon the almost finished George has converted a Cardinal to electric and he's got it within a week. We're going to have it on a video and hopefully get out to the field and see him fly it. It really looks cool. It's a unique airplane. I'll bet Bean Path Pothier is going to like it. Hey. And last night I happened to be out at this art supply store that I go to all the time. And I, the guy talked me into buying some of this rubber. It's called Softy. Red Rub Softy Polytech. And what I wanted to do, I thought maybe, being I haven't got my molding rubber from Florida, I made up a little test that I was going to use for silicone rubber for RTV. I want to run a little test on this. And one nice characteristic about this rubber here, it's totally, totally odor free. So this is made for art supply for making uh, you know, little statues and stuff. Anyway, it's worth a try. I'm not going to go into this right now, but if it does work, then I can use this to make up my mold for the landing gear. Now I'm just watching the air bubbles come out of the first half of this and thinking to myself, you know what I could really do is I could take the landing gear that I already have a mold for so that I could run a little test later today, make up another little test. I also have another little manifold I could make, even though I have working uh, 
I have enough of them right now anyway. I could make an extra mold just to have it. Anyway, we'll find out if this stuff is gonna is gonna work. There's no end to the amount of stuff when you get into this kind of a a part of the hobby. Everything there's just things within things within things worth trying, and you hope that you're gonna stumble on something that's really gonna work well for you. Now this I can also envision we might be able to make a we want to make some spinners, some carbon fiber spinners instead of uh, e glass. This may be appropriate rubber. Again, we'll find out. If you, if you test everything, you, there's a good chance you'll find one or two things that work. <laughs> material left over, so what I'm going to try to do is make what will be a test mold just to test the compatibility of working off a, 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 uh, a composite part. And I had some wood parts. These are the little blisters I left over just to check and they tell you in the instructions you're supposed to run a test anyway to check for compatibility. Well, this way we'll have a part that we know is a polyester, another polyester part, and a wood part. And what I also did, I went over by the toolbox and tried that polyurethane finish, poured a little bit out on the polyurethane finish. This gives me actually four tests out of one little batch of rubber. I want to do. I want to put a little more detail on these. I want to take and cut even thinner little pieces of arrow shaft, little half moons, to simulate where the oil seal would be on the oleo. Maybe one up here. I don't know. I want to see how this first one looks when I get it cut out and glued on. All right. Well, that looks okay. So I'll just replicate that out, just using little half moons of arrow shaft. And you can cut those with the. I found out the easiest way to cut them is with the uh, the Dremel saw or with a parting wheel. Each way, either way, will work. That's difficult to cut, by the way. <laughs> Trick while gluing it, of course, is to hold it with the tip of a number 11 blade. Get a dot of cement on there. And you can detail, now we can just go on and on and on here with details. You know what I want to do, I want to do pretty much the same thing up at the top here. This, this part down here, I kind of like the way it looks and I've been looking at the books to get a feel for just what this really should look like. And of course you can't make it totally scale, but this is a lot closer to, I think than the other gear were. Things it's handy to, to use for cleaning up the parts, especially the arrow shafts. Sandpaper is a little difficult to get in the corners and edges, but this seems to work real well. It's those green little, uh, I don't know what they call them, those sanding pads the 3M makes. You can buy these in a grocery store. Details like that. Every time you add a little detail, it just has a little more interesting look, a little more scale look. Step is to get a thin coat of CA on both sides of this, and we've done that on camera enough times. Wiping it with Q-tips so that the whole thing is sealed with CA before we start to build up a finish. And that'll just keep the plywood, any little joint that oil could get in, capillary action to the CA will fuel proof it and it'll stiffen it all up. And then when we go to make the mold, let's hope all these details will come out in the mold. If you wanted to, of course, you could just put 10 coats of auto primer on this. That would be okay, too. But I think the easiest way, this always seals the wood, and we can get a real quick finish on here. We'll put a couple of coats of acrylic, and this should, by the end of the day, be ready to paint.
Now once that kicks off, and I never use kick on it, but I can sand it right down. And the whole thing's got one coat of thin CA on it. And you don't really care whether it needs two or three, you want to seal the wood before you put any finish at all on there. Just make it easy. Now if you let the CA kick without, without putting any kicker on it, just give it some time to kick. It usually will sand pretty well. You can see it comes right off. I want to get this all in here, get this all detailed out, and this will be ready for a coat of paint. Now when you want to get in all these little corners and details, a little green pad is real good. If you don't, what happens, you're going to build up and lose all the details. Everything will get radiused out. It's also not bad, even though I prefer sandpaper, it's okay to just dress off all the edges so you have kind of a radius edge just where to paint, especially on these thin grooves, the paint won't come out. Now also, one of these little rulers, you have to kind of invent little ways of sanding things when you have these kind of details. But that groove, that is one of the things that's very prototypical, and I wanted to, to keep that as defined as possible. But the trick is here is just move the sandpaper, because you lose it right away. You only get a couple of swipes. But every little detail pays in the final analysis. And always use your hand to check for imperfections. Okay, I got this mask off. I mixed up some acrylic clear. 50-50, Flexol and Fish Eye. It's ready for the first coat of base coat. Okay, the first coat of acrylics on here. I don't want to go while this is drying. I have some other projects I want to get started on. Now, one of the things that I always like to think uh, I'm relatively competent at is time management. While that paint is drying, that acrylic is drying, on the next tape, we're going to make up a whole bunch of props. Four blades, two blades, go through our whole prop inventory. In fact, the next tape will probably be mostly devoted to props. But what I can do right now is get ahead on. This is just plain acetone. You can on the right side. On a paper towel, wipe the finish off. You also could make up a little pie pan, like if you could do it outside. It's too cold to be outside today. It's below freezing. So what we're going to do is, uh, this, this uses the minimum amount of stink in the house here, and I've got the door open anyway. I want to do this as soon as possible so the house can air out, but basically get the finish off the props. And while this, by the time I get done with a dozen or so of these that I have to do, what will happen is the other stuff will be dry and ready for the first coat of, uh, of paint. So good time management. While something is drying, you always be thinking about the next project. See, another thing too, I was molding up some more of these exhausts for a guy in Canada, Kevin King. So while one is drying, I always have something drying while something's being worked on. There's nothing more frustrating. You get up, go to the shop, you do something now, I have to wait till it dries, and you really don't have another project planned. One of the nice things about doing an acrylic base coat, this is what I call a quick finish. So you give it an hour or so up by a heating vent, you can sand it out, it doesn't chew and gum up on you. And especially on parts that you're not real concerned with the weight. If we did a dope finish, this would take two weeks to get the base coat on. Well, we don't really want to do that. A little bit of weight penalty. It won't it'll hardly even matter, so I do want to get some white on this. In fact, here we got a lump here that really didn't dry right. A little bit of a run there. I want to get some white on this and put this aside to dry and start getting my props ready. I got a bunch of them made up. Every year I like to go through and I'll try to put all the latest, the latest and greatest, or whatever you want to call it, whatever I've come across in the last year about props. Always good information about props. Never underestimate props. Okay, first coat of whites on the first one. It looks like it's drying up real nice. 
and you obviously want to get some. Hey, you know what I was thinking of doing? The stripes that go through the invasion stripes. I've seen some of the marks that have the invasion stripes kind of slanted on it. I'll have to look at some of the literature and see if I want to do that. I think these are going to work out well. And plus, now we'll have, when we're all done with this, we'll have two options. Short gear for concrete, long gear with big doors for the bigger wheels for grass. We'll have a lot of options on this plane. Now, I know while you're watching this in sunny Burbank, it's hard to believe how cold it is, and that heat, that heat hasn't shut off much today. It is cold out there. Anyway, that'll dry up. We'll get a coat of clear on that tomorrow, and whatever time we have left, we'll sand down a few more props. Now, I did get four of them done today, and of course, this is just time management stuff. Let me just... Let me get a couple more, but you can see what I'm doing. I'm making a selection of diameters. I'm from about 13 down to 12 and a half. I have a couple more I can work on today. And that's going to be about it for today's session. Here's the next thing is I want to try to simulate the, the way the invasion stripes go across the gear doors. That's one of the next things. I don't have that on the Spitfire, but I'd like to have it on this model. So what I did, I took the original gear door, tried to lay out pretty much where that stripe would be, and of course it should be kind of a mirror image of what actually sits there, because when that would fold down, I don't know if we only had retracts. Anyway, I just back mask that off, I get a little coat of clear on that, and then spray the black. That'll give me some kind of a little idea of if I'm going to like this, or if we're going to I'm going to try to add some more details to the inside or whatever we're going to do to dress this up. Now I'm going to let that cook off before I decide what else I'm going to do as far as some more details go here. Although I have to admit that that, that does not, did not come out bad considering it's like the, uh, the real quick, cheap, easy finish, whatever you want to call it. It's kind of a quick thing, but I think that'll be just one more little detail on the plane. Well, all those are drying up. I took this mold apart with the red rubber, and you can see what's happened. I wasn't happy with the way this is sticking to the part, and I want to try... One of the things I'm going to try, I'm going to make up a little test with this. This is a mold release agent. What I have a feeling is, is that you need, now see I had this other little test that just popped right out. But when you have a lot of back drafts, at least with this red rubber, I ran another little test here with those blisters. This, these just dropped right out, but on the complex shape, it broke the part up trying to get it out. So what I'm going to do is on the next one that I do get to run, I have some spare parts, of course. I'm going to try using some of that mold release agent and run up another little test to see if that's a good mold release agent for getting the part out. And I want to do that before I actually make up a more complex or a better mold with this. So what it would tell me is it's probably going to be fine for a spinner. There's no problem with that. That'll drop right in and right out. But on these complex little shapes, I need to get a better mold release agent. Well, what I thought I could do, I took a little piece of tubing, cut it in half, ground it down. This would just make it look a lot more like a uh, an oleo strut, I think. With I'm going to epoxy that in position. It gives it an extra little uh, dimension. And then, of course, we'll give this a couple of coats of clear and figure out if we want to do any other detailing on it. Again, these are a lot of small details, but I think they all add up. The overall impression is very dramatic when you can combine a lot of little details that people don't expect to see, and they look and they say, ooh. What I'm trying to do is I'm just trying to ink in the oil seal 
a little bit of ink here. And you can see the one that isn't. Every little detail starts to add up. As soon as I finish up the rest of these rivets, I'm going to give these a couple of coats of clear, put them aside to dry, and that'll pretty much be the end of this video. We also got some stuff, I'm going to put it on the end of this tape. I got some neat stuff from Ken Thompson about an air show in England that has a lot of Spitfires. A magazine that he found, I guess, at a garage sale. And she's pretty much ready for the clear. Okay, having them up by the heating vent, that should really cure them up. I want to go through that stuff that Kenny sent. Some nice stuff here. magazine we got from Ken Thompson has an awful lot of Spitfires from a show they had in England. I just want to run this off. We're at the end of the video. I don't want to start anything new here. We're just going to put multiple coats of clear on those gear legs until they're finished. And uh, we'll spend the rest of the day working on some prop technology. In fact, the next, the next video in the series is going to be devoted exclusively to props. Props. Oh, I love those five-bladed props. Anyway, this is a great magazine, and I appreciate that Ken is now joining us in uh, finding all the Spitfire, Seafire stuff there is to, to have on the planet and putting it all on video. The thing, too, is when I used to go garage sailing uh, with Karen, I used to find all these old magazines, and they're usually like 50 cents a piece. They usually have some neat stuff, too. Look at this. Oh, is that nice? Clip wing spit. Hey, speaking of that, here's the striping on the gear doors. And the spinner, which, which actually simulates that one, uh, the spinner that Joe likes, that English spinner. This is the kind of view I like. Oh, man, yeah, look at them into those exhaust pipes. The magazine also had something real interesting in it, aside from the Spitfire stuff. I'm going to pass this on to Tom Morris. Tom Morris is building a, uh, a P61, so anybody out there that has some information, maybe want to pass it on to Tom. Obviously, one of the nicest guys in the world is Stunt. Some nice nose art ideas here, and I and I hope Tom will get, will get some cool nose art here. Look at his one that the nose wheel folded up on. Pretty. Yeah, one of the things I really enjoy is sharing all this stuff. Knowing there's other people that uh, share the love of models that that we all seem to have. Yeah, there's no dream back right in the, right in the cockpit. Hey. Anyway, neat stuff. Talk about the nose art. Look at the nose art on this. Midgley. I know Midgley would like this. Midgley's nose art. Hey, you, gotta, you gotta get these ideas. Look, here's another picture here. You gotta get these, get these pictures from somewhere. Get these ideas. Exhaust pipes. Look at that nice exhaust. Kind of a nice paint job. I can just picture Aaronstein. How do I get those gear doors to go up? Oh God, Aaronstein! If you're not down here in a couple of weeks, I'm gonna whip you, man. Gotta get that thing in the air this year. Anyway, just one good source of inspirational ideas, paint jobs, and whatever. 
for 50 cents, hey, I'll take it. You could spend 50 cents on a hamburger and all you get is cholesterol. You buy old magazines, all you get is a fire trap in your house. Or a bathroom like mine where you can't even walk around with so many magazines. Cool, anyway. Just some of the Spitfires that are still flyable. There's 50 flyable Spitfires airworthy in the world right now. Okay, we're going to get to see you on the next tape. Let's get out the props, get out the pitch gauges. Let's go to prop heaven. Make up some props. See you on the next tape. Thanks for joining us.